On behalf of Calgary Public Library, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation, an afternoon with Dr. Danielle C. McRae, the Bentel Lecture on Christian Education and Theology. This program is presented in partnership with the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge Mokinsis, the land where the elbow and bow rivers meet. In the spirit of, of truth and reconciliation, we recognize the ancestral territories, cultures, and oral practices of the Blackfoot people, the Yahé Nakoda Nation, the Beaver people of the Sutina Nation, and the Mati Nation of Alberta Region 3. Calgary Public Library serves the community on this traditional land, and we honor all people who share, celebrate, and steward the Treaty 7 territory of Southern Alberta. During the program, if you have any question for our guest, please send them through the chat and we will read them out after the presentation. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Carolyn Music. Since July 2020, Carolyn Music holds the Chair of Christian Thought in the Department of Classics and Religion, University of Calgary. The holder of the Chair of Christian Thought engages in knowledge translation and initiates and organizes community events. Among these activities are four annual endowed public lectures that the Chair of Christian Thought organizes. The four are the Level Lecture in Christian Ethics, the Bentall Lecture on Education and Theology, the Swanson Lecture on Christian Spirituality and Theology, and the Iwasa Lecture on Urban Theology. These lectures demonstrate the breadth and depth of Christian culture and reflect how numerous disciplines intersect with the study of religion. The Department of Classics and Religion and Calgary Public Library have teamed up in partnership with the aim of making the endowed share of Christian thought public lectures accessible to a wide audience across not only Calgary, but the whole of Alberta. Carolyn, please take over. Thank you so much, Saritza, for that introduction. It's a pleasure working with the Calgary Public Library. Uh, before I introduce the 2022 presenter of the Chair of Christian Thought Bento Lecture on Education and Theology, I would like to say a few words about the Bento Lecture and who it is named after. Um, it is named in memory of the married couple, Dr. Shirley Bentel and her husband, Dr. Charles Howard Bentel. Let me say a little bit about uh, Howard. From 1938 to 1946, Howard Bentel served as senior minister at First Baptist Church in Regina. His next charges included Walmer Road Baptist Church, Toronto, and First Baptist Church in Calgary. In 1959, Howard Bentall was awarded an honorary doctorate of divinity um, from McMaster. From 1972 to 1992, he served as Associate Executive Minister for the Baptist Union of Western Canada. He was president of the Canadian Baptist Federation and vice president of the Canadian Bible Society. He was secretary treasurer of the Hawthorne Charitable Foundation, and this uh, foundation supports endeavors of the Christian church and other charities that serve humanitarian and social needs, both nationally and internationally. So I wanna say a few words about Dr. Shirley Bentall. Uh, Dr. Bent Shirley Bentall likewise demonstrated a life of service over the years, first in Toronto and then in Calgary at First Baptist Church, she took a prominent role in leading and advancing the position of women in the church. She was elected president of the Baptist Union of Western Canada from 1976 to 1977, and then became the first woman president of the Canadian Baptist Federation from 1985 to 1988. In 1989, McMaster awarded her an honorary doctorate of divinity. Uh, now I'd like to say a few words about both of them. Uh, in the early 1980s, the Bentall showed their commitment to education by helping launch this very position, the chair of Christian thought at the University of Calgary. 
1992, Shirley and Howard moved to British Columbia, where they worked to bring their vision of spiritual renewal and community to fruition through the creation of the Rivendell Retreat Center on Bowen Island and the Salisbury Community Society. Now the Salisbury Community Society oversees five houses in East Vancouver with the purpose of building communities that are characterized by diversity and provide support for resident refugees, refugee claimants. And Dr. Shirley Bentel passed away in 2005 and Dr. Howard Bentel passed away in 2008. The volunteer Ron Rivendell retreat that they established continues today as a testament to their generosity, compassion, and faith. It is a privilege to hold an annual Christian thought lecture in Calgary in honor of Dr. C. Howard Bentall and Dr. Shirley Bentall. Now I'd like to turn to uh, introduce uh, this year's 2022 uh, Bentall lecture speaker. Dr. Danielle C. McRae is Associate Professor of Homiletics at Yale Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. Her scholarship focuses on African-American preaching, sermon genre, and modes of authority. Her recent and forthcoming publications include the monograph, The Censored Pulpit, Julian of Norwich as Preacher, which was published in 2019. And uh, in this uh, book, Dr. McRae examines the relationship between embodiment and authority. Dr. McRae has a forthcoming monograph entitled, Is It a Sermon? And explores, this book explores genre fluidity in African-American preaching. Dr. McRae's deep concern about the workings of race in the church is reflected in her current collaboration on a documentary film with the Louisville Institute Cl Clergy Scholar Research Team on race, church, and theological practices. Now, in addition to these areas of research, for several years, Dr. McRae has studied the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray and is currently writing a book about Murray's preaching and spirituality entitled The Apostle Pauli. Now, yesterday, Dr. McRae spoke about Pauli Murray to the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. It was a wonderful lecture. And I wanna read out one of um, the emails I received after the lecture written by one of the uh, attendees. And this person wrote, I was so thoroughly engaged in the entire talk, a story of an absolutely astounding human being delivered beautifully, elegantly, and lovingly by Dr. McRae. I will certainly be doing more reading on Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray. And what a perfect summary of yesterday's lecture. So now I'd, I would like to welcome Dr. McRae uh, I'd like to welcome you to the University of Calgary in partnership with the Calgary Public Library. And we would like to welcome you as the 2022 presenter of the Chair of Christian Thought Bento Lecture on Education and Theology. The title of the lecture is Quilter as Truth Teller, Harriet Powers, Rosie Lee Tompkins, and Their Stitch Sermons. Welcome, Dr. McRae. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a generous and gracious introduction. Um, I'm so happy that we have this time together. And it's important that I too begin with a land acknowledgement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Malhegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagosset, Nihantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquian speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. Well, what a joy and what a deep honor uh, to be with you today to talk about a topic that means so much to me. 
Today's lecture draws from a forthcoming book on sermon genre and call, called, Is It a Sermon? Genre Fluidity in African-American Preaching. I'm interested in what I call the shoreline of homiletics, the place where preaching laps up against other forms of discourse. For example, there are the sermonic performances. Isaiah walked naked and barefoot for three years. Simon Stylite um, lived on a pillar 50 feet in the air. We also see preaching that merges with prayer or song. Consider the Baptist deaconess whose morning prayer rhythmically flows into sermon. Or the gospel soloist who breaks into a little sermonette. The point here is that the gospel dances in and out of the forms we create for it. I'm interested in the possibilities that emerge when we play at that shoreline. What modes of preaching get overlooked due to, due to genre classification? And what types of proclamation go unrecognized because they don't meet our expectations for what a sermon is supposed to look like? Today, I'll explore just one example, the quilted sermon. I've organized today's lecture into five segments or patches, if you will. First, I'll offer an introduction to Harriet Powers, a 19th century African-American woman who quilted sermons. Second, I'll take a deep dive into her quilts so you can experience them. And I'll point out some of the ways that she draws on black preaching traditions and some areas where she expands them. Third, I'll tease out some of the contemporary implications for authority, embodiment, and sermon genre. Then I'll make a brief return to Rosie Lee Tompkins, a 20th century African-American quilter, and reflect on some of the implications of her faith-inspired quilts. Finally, I'll turn to you and hope we can have some good discussion. If we had unlimited time and resources, we'd all board a bus and go down to Athens, Georgia. We'd take the winding roads that snake through town and pull up to Gospel Pilgrim Cemetery, memorialized here in slide one. Gospel Pilgrim was a cemetery founded in 1882 by a small group of people who had been enslaved. Approximately nine acres, some 3,500 bodies are there. Now, there haven't been burials in Gospel Pilgrim for decades now. Gospel Pilgrim is a place that feels walled off, not just because of the gates that surround it, but because of the weeds that despite periodic efforts by local volunteers grow knee high in some places, waste and shoulder high in others. And it's a place thick with energy as if trees and weeds and the air itself are guarding these burial places and giving those laid to rest a measure of the protection they should have enjoyed in life. Harriet Powers is buried there. Harriet was a mother, sister and friend, and for a time, a wife. She was a farmer and homemaker, but celebrated for her quilting. Harriet Powers was born to an enslaved mother on October 29, 1837. She had family members who worked on different plantations near Atlanta, but it's unclear exactly where Powers was born. In 1855, she marries Armstead Powers, and after the Civil War, they moved to an area right outside Athens, Georgia. That's where the University of Georgia is. Eventually, they purchase a four acre farm and support themselves and their children there. When she isn't absorbed with farm work, housework or child rearing, she makes quilts and religious themes inspire these quilts. Powers seems to have made at least five quilts 
including three that have not been found. One with 4,050 diamonds, one that's called a star quilt, and another depicting the Lord's Supper. The two remaining quilts are Bible quilt, dated around 1886, now at the National Museum of American History, and pictorial quilt, dated around 1895 to 1898, depending on who's assessing. Uh, the pictorial quilt is part of the collection of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Both quilts demonstrate remarkable skill, but Powers takes the unusual step of linking her quilting to preaching. She calls her first sermon, her first quilt, a sermon in patchwork and shares an intention to quote, preach the gospel in patchwork, to show my Lord my humility and to show where sin originated out of the beginning of things. Given this aim, her quilts provide unique insight into the content of a late 19th century African-American woman's preaching and show us a preacher who did not rely exclusively on orality in her proclamation. In quilting, Powers draws on a medium that African-American women have used to tell stories, testify, and create new possibilities out of fragmentation. One might even compare quilting to a dialect through which women claimed voice. If we read this practice through Diana Taylor's work in the archive and the repertoire, it becomes clear that late 19th century black women's quilting is an embodied practice that transfers cultural knowledge. Gladys Marie Fry, a quilt historian puts it this way, denied the opportunity to read or write, slave women quilted their diaries, creating permanent but unwritten records of events large and small, of pain and loss, of triumph and tragedy in their lives. Each piece of cloth became the focal point of a remembered past. African-American quilts remain a vital source for cultural study, even if the research process is hindered by limited data, documentation challenges, and a history of devaluing the artistic and intellectual worth of Black women's work. Creative genius is evident in the composition, skilled embroidery, use of color, and in the fact that they sometimes dyed the fabric and even made the thread. Harriet Powers' case is exceptional due to her skill and the availability of records to document her life and work. The study of 19th century African-American women's preaching tends to focus on individual personalities like Jarena Lee, Amanda Berry Smith, Julia Foote, or Mary Small. Less attention is focused on the content of their sermons because few records exist. Harriet Powers quilts make unique additions to this small collection and offer us content. In a letter, Powers refers to quilt in slide three, and maybe we can go back to it, back to slide three. In a letter, Powers refers to this quilt in slide three as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Though now it's now generally called Bible quilt. While the coloring seems a little bit more subdued today, keep in mind that this is over 130 years old. In 1886, the pink, green, and orange hues would have been more vivid. But more, the quilt has some distinctive features of African-American handiwork. In addition to vibrant color, notice the large scale of the design elements, the juxtaposition of multiple patterns. Notice the contrasting sash trim the little squares that are on most of the corners and the deliberate use of asymmetry. These aesthetic elements carry an improvisational quality. Comparisons have been made between Powers design and applique patterns 
in quilts of the Dahomey, but it's important to stress that there are as many similarities as there are differences. Howard's work is clearly innovative. Silhouettes of animals and celestial bodies and humans are appliqued in panels to depict biblical stories and give them a universal dimension. A few other features distinguish Power's quilt. First, vertical orientation was common during the time, but hers reads horizontally. It's also about 75 inches by 89 inches and not intended for sleeping. And second, Powers composed an interpretation for each panel of the quilt, underscoring the didactic purpose. The Bible quilt seen here consists of 11 panels that unfold like sermonic moves, scenes that unfold cinematically to form an overarching argument. She begins with the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Beautiful animals abound with its vivid stripes, if you can see the orange and black stripes up the top, with its vivid stripes and delicate orange feet, an alluring serpent dominates the upper right corner of the first panel. The second panel shows Adam, Eve, and Cain, each with a pet. Cain's peacock may symbolize pride because next, Satan triumphs among the seven stars. On the second row, she begins with a macabre scene. A line of red depicts Cain murdering Abel. Abel's blood cries out from the ground. Exile follows, leaving Cain in the land of Nod. The panel symbolizes impending judgment and marks a turning point in the quilt and in her understanding of salvation history. But things get more hopeful in the sixth panel where an angel descends Jacob's ladder. It looks kind of like a swing and that angel comes to earth. In the seventh, the first New Testament scene, the Holy Spirit descends on Christ like a dove, the big brown dove. The magnitude of Christ's redemptive work is represented next in the crucifixion. While gazing at this panel, Harriet Power said, wipe it out in the world, wipe sin out in the world. Then she turns to Judas's betrayal and presence at the Last Supper. She's emphasizing the depth of Christ's betrayal and the extent of his redemptive work. Judas um, at the Last Supper is depicted in drab cloth because she said he had to have been kind of drab. Though the sequencing is somewhat opaque, she ends with the Holy Family, a new beginning. In some, she argues that the sin of Adam and Eve in the first panel is redeemed through the birth of Christ in the last panel. So this is a sermon about sin and redemption. Eight of the 11 panels warn viewers to guard against sin. The remaining three, the remaining three all positioned on the right side of the quilt include a figure that descends from the upper right corner. Notice the angel descending on Jacob's ladder, the dove descending to represent Jesus' baptism, and the large Bethlehem star descending in her final panel. In each case, these descending figures draw the viewer's eye up and to the right, just as the striped serpent did in her first panel. Marie Jean Adams, an art historian, interprets this firm direction of the viewer's gaze as a declaration of faith one Harriet does not want the viewer to miss. She wants us to see her argument about sin being eclipsed by the redemptive power of God. And we can stop sharing the image for a moment now. Harriet Power's role as a storyteller is unmistakable. 
I think Mario Losa is right when he says a storyteller reaches into the marrow of a culture, touching its history and mythology, giving body to its taboos, images, ancestral desires and terrors. It means being in the most profound way possible rooted in that culture. In a similar way, telling the story is a fundamental aspect of African-American preaching and Powers draws on elements of this tradition in her quilts. For example, when she gave Cain a pet peacock, she engages in imaginative elaboration. When she places a dressmaker's form in the Garden of Eden, she embraces the biblical story as if it were her personal story. She also depicts scenes as if she were an eyewitness. Each of these narrative techniques is enumerated as a distinguishing characteristic of Black preaching in a book called Black Preaching, Recovery of a Powerful Art by the late Henry Mitchell, the icon of Black homiletics who died just, um, just earlier this month at the age of 102. But more, Harriet Power's sermons point to an omnipotent God who was aligned with the weak or the oppressed. According to Cleophas LaRue, this approach gives her a hermeneutical anchor in Black preaching, which despite variations in style and performance, tends to convey a message about a mighty God who sides with suffering people. The storyteller's task is to quote Alice Walker, to make the culture visible to itself. And Powers makes black culture visible to itself by speaking through a medium that was historically treasured by black women to steward cultural history. It's no surprise that the quilt drew attention when Powers displayed it at the Athens Cotton Fair. The quilt caught the eye of Jenny Smith, a local artist and teacher who offered to buy the quilt, but Powers said that she was not willing to sell, not at any price. Five years later, circumstances changed. The Powers, family was struggling financially, and Armstead, Harriet's husband, urged her to sell. She offers to sell her quilt to Jenny Smith for $10. Smith counter-offered for $5. With more pressure from Armstead, Harriet agrees to sell. Smith remembers the reluctance in Power's voice when she said, my old man says, owing to the hardness of the times, I better take it. And notes that not being a new woman, she obeyed. Yet before parting with the quilt, Powers sits down with Jenny Smith and explains the interpretation of each of the quilt panels. Notes from that encounter are with the quilt at the, Smith, at the Smithsonian. Heartbroken, Powers makes several return visits, heartbroken, Powers makes several return trips to visit her quilt, prompting Jenny Smith to call it the darling offspring of her brain. In 1895, Powers' life has changed. She's 58 and she and her husband Armstead have separated. He has a new partner, She's managing the farm, the house, and her finances on her own, and even mortgages a plot of land to buy her own buggy for $16.89. Still, she makes time to quilt. By 1898, she finishes what we call the pictorial quilt, seen here in image four. Like its predecessor, this quilt is not intended as a bed covering, and more, it has no filling. It incorporates bright orange, pink, red, green, and shades of blue. Notice again the African-American distinctives, the contrasting sash trim, 
the placement of squares at many of the corners, and the deliberate asymmetry. She uses appliqued silhouettes to tell biblical stories, but also adds other stories that inspire her. At 60 by 105 inches, this quilt is larger than the first, but still reads horizontally and has didactic intent. Each panel comes with a description. One central motif of this quilt is the divine hand, which appears three times, one in each row. The divine hand creates, guides, judges, and protects, caring for humans and animals. Yet her argument is more complex in this quilt because she lays a biblical narrative alongside celestial phenomena and local legends. The central theme is judgment. Her biblical stories are those in which God sends a sign that is either misunderstood or ignored, like Moses lifting a serpent in the air, thought to foreshadow the crucifixion, or Jonah spending three days in the whale, prefiguring the three days Jesus spends in the tomb. She also alludes to Noah gathering two animals of every kind to go into the ark another great sign that was not heeded. If you look at panel five, again, counting horizontally, in the top right-hand corner, you'll see a depiction of John the Baptist baptizing Christ and the spirit of God descending on Christ's shoulder like a dove. This too refers to a heavenly sign that is disregarded in the crucifixion, which is depicted in the quilt's final panel at the bottom. The theme of impending judgment carries over when she turns to local legends and atmospheric events. Notice her second panel. It depicts the dark day of May 19th, 1780, a day when mysteriously darkened skies covered much of New England and part of Canada. Many thought the dark sky was an omen since this event took place well before Powers was born, she probably learned about it through oral history. Her eighth panel refers to November 13, 1833, a day when falling stars led many to believe the world had come to an end. In the 11th panel, she recalls a terrifying cold spell where bluebirds are killed and humans freeze in the bitter weather. The 12th panel depicts the meteor shower that terrified humans and animals in the red light night of 1846. In each case, the events were understood as signs of divine judgment. Now the 13th panel doesn't refer to weather, but portrays two rich Virginians, Bob and Kate Bell, who according to Powers, were taught nothing of God. It's unclear if she had a direct connection to the bells, but her central theme of judgment is amplified loudly here. These are the only two people who are named and singled out other than biblical figures. When I think of what uh, Powers is doing here, it strikes me as a focused gaze to draw on Toni Morrison it's a gaze that is a sort of staring, a refusal to look away. What did Bob and Kate Bell do that was so horrible that puts them in league with the sign of Noah, Jonah, or supernatural omens? We don't know. Even pinpointing uh, Bob and Kate Bell has turned up little. What is clear is that Powers has a gaze that calls attention to the cosmic consequences of everyday choices and rivets us on the point where past, present, and future coalesce. Ernst Cassira calls this mythical consciousness, and it's been described as a gaze that, quote, equates the present with primeval and historic past and as a mode of thought that raises to cosmic epic levels 
the daily choices and events of our lives. It allows a longer lingering vision that penetrates the outer layer of individual behavior and seeks to find meaning in lives that goes beyond what we see and observe on the surface. Power's gaze is instructive for preachers because a central part of the preaching task is allowing the past and future to intrude upon the present. What I hope is clear is that neither of Power's quilts is a sentimental assembly of biblical stories. Weighty theological arguments are made. The quilts recount biblical stories and oral histories, but they also warn of divine justice. And like any good preacher, Powers tries to make divine activity as vivid to the viewer as reality. Powers draws on what Toni Morrison calls discredited knowledge, knowledge that grows out of the beliefs, values, and experiences of African-American culture. In her essay, Rootedness, The Ancestor as Foundation, Morrison explains, Black people were discredited, therefore what they knew was discredited. Elsewhere, Morrison attributes discredited knowledge to people who are ignored, who occupy the background while others take the limelight, yet, know, yet they know more about human motives, quandaries, and fears than we would expect. Carolyn Denard, a Morrison scholar, suggests discredited knowledge is central in Morrison's work because she wants to give visibility and credibility to Black people, particularly those who are discredited within the Black community. And this task involves allowing them to speak in their own languages. Harriet Powers' quilted sermons reveal the brilliance of her discredited knowledge and allow her to preach in her own language. These sermons also give us a sense of Powers' spirituality. God is a mighty ruler who observes earthly affairs and intervenes on behalf of the weak. Humans gain knowledge of God by their obedience to scripture and attention to divine revelation, which includes history, climatology, uh, celestial occurrences and everyday events. And humans aren't dependent creatures, and humans are dependent creatures who are both vulnerable and resilient, prone to forget God's providence, but sustained by grace. Because of their susceptibility to evil, humans are in dire need of spiritual counsel. One of the most intriguing aspects of Harriet Power's spirituality concerns her fascination with stars. Stars appear in almost all of her panels and serve as witnesses to earthly events. If one steps back from the Bible quilt, letting the panels recede, it becomes clear that stars figure as prominently as humans and animals. With so many stars, the quilt resembles a sky map. Powers uses an intricate technique when sewing the stars, seen here in this close-up in image five. Each one is sewn by hand from tiny bits of cloth that have been cut into sharp triangles and set on a contrasting background. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich notes that Harriet Power's strategy for making stars mirrors that of another Georgia quilter, Mary Bryan of nearby Elbert County, Georgia. Bryan, however, incorporates her stars in a quilt using piecework while Powers uses applique. In any event, this extraordinary detail is evident to viewers, but would be even more obvious to one touching the quilt. According to one quilt historian, uh, Gladys Fry, the tiny triangles in the stars are believed to be symbols of prayer. And anyone touching the triangles 
would experience a tactile reminder to pray. Powers may also be drawing on dimensions of slave spirituality in which stars served as literal guides and metaphorical signs of hope. Harriet's fondness for stars contributes to an eclectic spirituality in which nature, biblical stories, and local legends all mediate divine wisdom. And this eclecticism has implications for authority. And we can stop sharing for a moment. Powers quilts emerge at a time when there are few Black women preachers. One reason for these small numbers concerns authority. In homiletics, when we think of authority, we generally refer to the compositive factors that undergird the power to speak and shape the responsiveness of the listeners. Now, authority has many tendrils, ecclesiastical, owing to ordination, charismatic, due to the Holy Spirit's influence, and personal, due to the preacher's identity and experience of self-expression. Sexism, racism, and class stratified contexts and other experiences or expectations of bias complicate questions of authority. The underlying issue is the, the underlying issue is power. How is it held and how is it imagined? In Harriet Power's context, preaching was generally understood to be a male prerogative, making a woman preacher a puzzle, if not a renegade. This was almost certainly true in the Black Baptist churches where Harriet worshiped in Athens though some Black Baptist congregations um, included preaching women called gospel mothers who strengthened congregations with their exhortations. These gospel mothers claimed to be under the special influence of the spirit and often had as much influence as ministers, if not more. Gospel mothers had little formal authority, but considerable, considerable credibility. They earn this credibility by offering encouraging messages, interpreting dreams, praying for people, and giving advice. They were known for being open to the many ways God speaks. These women orchestrated Black church culture by incubating communal hopes and epitomizing the life of faith. Harriet Powers may have been such a woman, revered for her wisdom and held in affectionate regard. She could have also been more like a conjure woman whose proclamation functioned largely outside of church settings. Unfortunately, we do not have records that clarify her role in the church. Yet whatever her role, hauling the quilt sermons or sermons in patchwork takes nerve and gives the messages weight. This naming is a form of self-authorization. Harriet Powers presents some fresh angles for thinking about authority in less hierarchical ways. For example, she claims the authority inherent in engaging in a creative act, the authority of invention. James Noel argues that it isn't sufficient to interpret African-American art without considering the religious significance inherent in creative acts. Quote, because of the extreme deprivation to which Africans were subjected during and subsequent to their arrival in the Americas, their artistic products required a tremendous feat on their part to muster and assert a humanity that was on the brink of annihilation. Hence, when studying African-American art, we must always bear in mind not only the work under interpretation, but the creative act itself. Harriet Powers is quilting during a grim period in African-American history, but creates a symbolic universe 
that acknowledges the harsh reality of her life without accepting those realities as definitive. Her quilting functions as the site of divine human encounter and is a means of affirming personhood. Her ideas are presented through a talking needle, an instrument that is supposed to be confined to domestic labor. Through the needle, she speaks when she's expected to be silent and has something substantive rather than flatly decorative to say. She claims creative power by finding a purpose for torn, damaged fabric, things otherwise considered trash. Through the needle, she brings these thought to be worthless scraps together in peculiar ways. Clashing patterns combine and announce new arrangements. Or to quote Bakhtin, her work testifies to the potentiality of another world, another order, another way of life. One in which stars and animals matter as much as people and nature is heard screaming through thick, inexplicable darkness at midday. Despite the heavy themes, there is buoyancy in the quilts, a sense of delight that gestures towards the sublime. And I'd say this buoyancy of hers is also authorizing because joy is a source of power and energy, giving us the freedom to play and improvise. Joy is its own charism, testifying to the ability to float on that which might otherwise overwhelm us. Black preaching at its best combines inconsolability and buoyancy. And I see powers doing that here. There's a gentleness in Power's use of quilts for preaching that I appreciate too. Whether she's conscious of it or not, she gives her viewers a respite from the wounding power of language. Judith Butler explores this issue in her work when, when she discusses the vulnerability of address, which stems from the psychic violence to which language has been put and the power we immediately give over to others when we listen to them. The human mind is like an ocean in its receptivity, vulnerable to whatever toxins are thrown in. The quilts respect the vulnerability of address and the ongoing life the message will have in the minds of the viewers. Now, not long ago, I was studying the papers of Alice Walker and came upon a fan letter she treasured for many years. The letter written by a woman named Laura and dated July 10th, 1988, thanked Alice Walker for her book, Living by the Word. And she says, the book did not end, but will live on within me. The book, she says, was an inner validation of my own voice. Walker treasured this feedback because these were central aims of the book. And these aims provide a helpful frame for thinking about Harriet Power's preaching. She offers symbols and stories intended to find their fullest life in the imagination of the viewer. They are intended to live on in us, to live on in us. Next, Harriet Power's sermons raise questions about preaching and embodiment. By embodiment, I'm referring to the quality of physical presence, the gravitas in how a preacher makes herself present in a message. Ordinarily, this presence is mediated in voice and gesture, but there's an elusiveness at work. As David Applebaum argues in his book, Voice, language actually covers over and obscures the voice. I am talking in a hidden voice now. 
If I want it to reveal my true voice, I need to cough or laugh or groan or cry. Gesture, similarly, reveals most when it's natural rather than when it's choreographed. So a preacher's embodiment during a sermon in, is always unstable, concealing in its attempt to reveal. This dynamic is essential to understanding Harriet Power's embodiment. She speaks through presence and absence. She's present through her talking needle that stitches together her argument, her images, and her vision of divine action. This medium makes her ideas real, literally tactile. She lets us touch the fruit of her mind. The quilts are also the work of her body, even stained with her blood. Yet these patchwork sermons have a conspicuously absent preacher. In fact, her absence gives her a heightened presence, allowing her body to speak in excess. The dynamic is similar to that of the Apostle Paul, whose letters testified to his bodily existence and made him present to congregations despite his imprisonment. His confined body was announced as vulnerable to the powers and principalities, but not consumed by those powers. Harriet Powers quilts are, like Paul's, written in her own hand, and the quilts invoke her presence as well as those of her ancestors who taught her the practice of quilting. Harriet Powers re rehabilitates our vision with this interplay of absence and presence. Under this reformed gaze, we encounter the invisible world. Even if one appreciates Harriet Powers' theological argument and artistry, it may be hard to see how these quilts are sermons apart from her use of that label. She draws on a visual and tactile medium and pairs it with written interpretations of each panel. Yet she subordinates the oral component that is usually deemed essential for sermonic discourse. Here, it's worth noting that sermon is a fluid genre, far more fluid than most histories of preaching tend to admit. And Powers is not the first to describe visual art as sermonic. Wall paintings, sculptures, and other religious artwork were deemed silent preaching by medieval apologists. In an article entitled Typology of the Medieval Sermon and its Development in the Middle Ages, Report on a Work in Progress, Beverly Maine Kenzel argues that in medieval England, the umbrella of sermon covered poetry, drama, treatises, commentaries, and letters, even if they were never brought to speech. Content might even begin in one form and evolve into another, or defy boundaries by flowing to and fro between categories. This flux was possible because there was appreciation for the dynamism of texts, the way texts incorporate tensions and contradictions without resolving them. There was also a sense that the gospel is beyond human control and defies conclusive categorization. Its vibrancy blurs and exceeds the boundaries of narrative, parable, exhortation, or other similar homiletical classifications. Anise Bawarshi explains that genres ultimately are the rhetorical environments within which we recognize, enact, and consequently reproduce various situations, practices, relations, and identities. Genre shapes how we enter a given rhetorical moment how we abide within it, and how we relate it to other forms. In other words, 
a well-established genre transmits certain cultural attitudes, attitudes which it is shaped by and in turn helps shape. 19th century American preaching was defined by the regard given to the speech of ordained men. Powers finds a way to participate anyway with her quilted sermons. She shows us that genres are not static. And more, she reveals how Black preaching is enriched by improvisation and experimentation. Harriet Powers died of pneumonia on January 1st, 1910, but her quilted sermons continue to speak. They reveal the importance of moving beyond documents when studying 19th century African-American preaching. Sermon manuscripts, letters, diaries, and eyewitness accounts are all valuable resources, but other modes of discourse like quilting play an essential role in recovering black women's voices. But more than opening new avenues for research, I marvel at the implications for homiletics. Harriet Power's sermons decenter the pulpit and encourage us to take seriously the work of lay preachers who do not use conventional approaches. I would love to take a preaching course taught by Harriet Powers. I think she would pose some revolutionary questions. Like first, why should a pastor's dull 20 minute talk count as a sermon when mine is suspect? But more, what does it mean to know a text and let it live in you? In what unexpected ways might it come out? I think she'd describe a sermon as a husk for divine encounter, as a gateway for deepening faith, as an encounter that sharpens our recognition of divine action in the world, and as a message witnessed by the living, the dead, and those coming after us. I think she'd say a sermon expands affective and perceptive capacities and is characterized mostly by the kind of energy, the kind of spiritual energy it yields. Harriet Powers quilts bring us to a place where our prior understandings of the sermon genre become inadequate. I think of the quilted sermon as a form of layered address, one that helps us hear not only scripture, but Harriet and Harriet's ancestors. It's helpful to put Harriet Powers quilts in conversation with those of a more contemporary woman who also uses quilts to express her faith, Rosie Lee Tompkins, pictured here in image six. Rosie Lee Tompkins picks up fabric. It is the color of June sky and adorned with yellow, white, and orange flowers. With tangerine thread, she moves in and around the crevices of the flowers to stitch words with painstaking care. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Her little blue quilt square is surrounded by other sunny fabric squares. She incorporates more than two dozen different fabrics with vibrant floral designs that run horizontally, vertically, diagonally, and in curling vines. Together they form a riotous garden and surround a central figure of Christ. Several small black squares try to break up the joyous energy, but they are outmatched by the surrounding jubilance and recede into the dense array of flowers. Clearly this quilt is also an exhortation. The woman we know as Rosie Lee Tompkins was born in rural Arkansas on September 6, 1936 and named Effie Mae Martin. Her parents were Sadie Lee Dale and Mercury Martin. Effie Mae left Arkansas for California in 1958 
but maintained emotional ties to Arkansas. Upon arriving to the East Bay area, she um, tried to construct a life for herself that wouldn't have been possible in Arkansas due to racial segregation and limited uh, economic opportunities. She worked as a convalescent nurse, married in 1963, becoming Effie Mae Howard Martin, excuse me, becoming Effie Mae Martin Howard. She raised five children and stepchildren and attended the Beacon Light Seventh-day Adventist Church. By 1970, Effie May was making quilts and selling them at local flea markets, and even had business cards made stating that she made crazy quilts. Now, while there are few details, she had a nervous breakdown in the late 1970s, and she began producing more quilts after this event. Effie May prayed for the gift of quilting, treating it like a charismatic gift akin to healing or prophecy. She believed her quilts could be vehicles for divine love. And despite having no formal artistic training, she trusted her prayer for the gift of quilting was answered. Quilting became a way to self-soothe, remember, pray, and express her faith. Now, many African-American women of her generation cherished their privacy, but apparently this was doubly true in Effie May's case. Perhaps her hesitance stemmed from the stigma associated with mental illness. We don't know the reasons, but she was resolute in avoiding the spotlight. Around 1987, Eli Leon, a quilt scholar and collector eager to get more of her work into the public sphere, suggested that she use an alias. The name Rosie Lee Tompkins was created. The name mirrors the syllables and prosody of Effie Mae Howard while shielding her privacy. She used this pseudonym until her death in December of 2006 at age 70. Tompkins quilts carry a good deal of affective energy and surprise as seen here in image 7b. Her eclectic approach to asymmetry often resembles collage. Her work demonstrates fondness for experimentation and breaking conventions. She likes to unsquare squares by linking them with L or U shapes or extending lines past the expected end of a corner of a square. The symbol of the cross also appears regularly, often in clusters as shown here in image 7C. Beading, ornamentation and trim are also recurrent. She also incorporates tiny quilts within her quilt that draw the viewer's eye in, reminding us of the significance of small things. Constellations of unmeasured shapes ripple and give the quilts a sense of movement. She prefers to be guided by intuition instead of by a ruler or a template. And these instincts yield generosity and freedom. Ultimately, Tompkins hoped her quilts would, quote, spread a lot of love. Tompkins is not only drawn to color, but often to trios of color, as seen here in image eight. I think it's because I love them so much that God let me see all these different colors, she said. She sometimes links a color with a, speci a specific loved one, red and black for her brothers, blue for her son Alvin. The yellow, purple, and orange quilt honors three family members who have sixes in their birthdays. Certain combinations of colors assigned to specific individuals reflected a prayer for the relationship among the members of that trio. And some of Rosie Lee Tompkins' quilts 
seem to function as eulogies for loved ones who have died. These mournful quilts use color to extol the deceased and reveal an inner truth the person radiated. Texture is as important as color. At eight by 12 feet, this 2002 quilt, pictured in image nine, is representative of the bursts of color she brings together, but also reveals her attention to texture. In addition to buttons, she incorporates cotton, canvas, polyester, fleece, wool, and velour. Now I should add velvets and velour were among her favorite textures. Um, they were suitable for achieving what one scholar calls efficacious touch. A series of scriptural references are stitched in sprawling hand script on the bottom and uh, edge of the quilt. These appear to be references to Matthew, Acts, Luke, James, and Psalms. Even though the cognitive argument she makes, if any, appears to be hidden, these scripture references carry a sense of immediacy. Their truth exceeds language and erupts in color and texture that the viewer is invited to internalize. Now, clearly, Tompkins quilts are not as explicit as Harriet Powers. Instead, she beckons us into an enveloping experience of grace. Tompkins once told Eli Leon, if people like my works, that means the love of Jesus Christ is still shining through what I'm doing. This goal of touching the soul is evident even though some of her thinking is deliberately opaque. I think of her quilts as visual testimonies. She's sharing her inner experience of truth and inviting us to discern our own. Now, preaching is often understood as a transaction as transactional rhetoric. The preacher delivers content, a message, and the listener receives it. Delivery reception. This understanding of preaching undergirds the sermons of many preachers, including some African American preachers. But more often, African American preaching seeks to summon knowledge the listener already holds. And this tends to be communal knowledge. All the members of the congregation hold this knowledge. When the preacher summons this inner truth, everyone in the church says, Amen in call and response. Tompkins' work adheres to this aspect of African-American preaching. Instead of preaching a discursive message, Tompkins offers one that Charles Long would call archaic or predicated on the priority of something already there, something given. Tompkins' symbols and textures facilitate a process of crawling back to a deeper level of consciousness, pre-verbal, taking us to a level of consciousness that is already within, but encumbered. And a core aim of Black preaching is to tap that inner well of spiritual knowledge and bring it to the surface, to reach into the heart of the listener. It's important to note, and we, could, we can stop sharing this, this quilt for a moment. It's important to note that Rosie Lee Tompkins quilts involve haptic visuality. As Laura Marks puts it, haptic visuality requires that we gaze for an extended period before making conclusions about what we are beholding. Tompkins' combinations of color and texture slow us down and evade a purely distant view. The eyes function as organs of touch. Or to say it differently, 
by varying the textures of her fabrics and ornamenting them with embellishments, Tompkins effectively converts vision to touch, uniting the subject and the object of touching physically, somatically, spatially, affectively, and psychologically. Tompkins invites us to touch her quilts with our eyes and be touched by them. Let me conclude by noting that Christianity aims not merely for cognitive understanding of the gospel, but for an experience of the ineffable that recenters how one moves through the world. Through their quilts, Harriet Powers and Rosie Lee Tompkins seek to facilitate such an experience, an ineffable experience. Like all great sermons, their quilts warn, enchant, exhort, and encourage us not to conform to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In the words of another elderly African-American quilter, Willia at Graham, their quilts are like flashing a light in your face in the dark showing you there's something else to see. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. McCray. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, a wonderful introduction too, to the depth and um, beauty of uh, alternative preaching. And it's such a, an eye opener on, on every level. So thank you so much for that. Um, if I could uh, just launch in and invite uh, the audience uh, members to please type any questions that you have in the chat. But um, this is uh, the topic of preaching is something I'm very uh, interested in. And, um, and also this, um, uh, the fluidity in the nature of preaching and sermons and that it is much more varied and multifaceted um, in its history. And that is something hard to shake, I think, um, getting people to look at preaching and sermons in a different way, which you're doing so effectively here. And I, I wanted to say that I've, I've run into similar sorts of, um, I would say probably blocking of of what is happening when uh, people are trying to communicate um, perhaps uh, Christian truths, gospel truths. And I think uh, I'm a medievalist. So I'm thinking of the example of Francis of Assisi who is recognized mm. as one of the greatest preachers and precisely because of his performativity, uh, his use of song, his use of, um, of recreating the uh, narrative of the nativity scene and being in the manger with the animals and reenacting the whole sense of, uh, of, the, of the nativity through performance and how that is recognized in scholarship as a, a form of preaching. Mm -hmm. However, when um, uh, women, contemporary women of him uh, of his time did the same thing, um, that is not recognized as preaching in the current scholarship. And so there seems to be that uh, difficulty in, in recognizing um, uh, that preaching could take place or could be performed by women at, at this time. Yes. And uh, it seems to be that uh, you, uh, are you encountering that in your presentation of Harriet Powers' Uh, quilts as a form of preaching? Are there people who push back on that uh, uh, definition? Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> I think that um, so much of this has to do with authority, right? Mm -hmm. um, questions of what, what we consider a preaching or what we consider a sermon is governed so much by the authority of the person who is performing the message. Mm -hmm. And without that sort of baseline of authority, it's easy to sweep things aside. Um, I, I think uh, when I think of um, 
sermon, I should say, I do think sermon is a more narrow category than what I call preaching. Mm -hmm. Preaching is a broader umbrella that would include embodied witness, um, song, other modes of discourse. Mm -hmm. Sermon tends to be some kind of didactic teaching given by an authorized individual in a um, in a you know a clerical setting of some kind, or at least that's that's how we have understood it. Um, but I think even that is more narrow than it than it has to be. And um, thinking about the complexity of um, Francis's um, case that you mentioned is really helpful because he himself demonstrates a really broad view of mm -hmm. preaching. It can be a very explicit teaching in a formal setting, or um, he preached to animals, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, he, he invites us to think elastically about um, the practice of bearing witness. Mm -hmm. And I find that really helpful. I also find it very helpful for this historical moment when, um, you know, at least in the United States, many people are leaving church mm -hmm. and um, ex ex seeking faith and experience of faith in other ways. How might we experience the gospel outside of the 20 minute speech by a clergy person? Mm -hmm. It's a real question that we have to consider. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, okay. uh, could you say something about uh, who these ladies quilted with and to whom they shared their stories? Mm. Was this mostly a family affair, especially for the first women? For, mm -hmm. for the first for Such Harry. a good question. Um, so historically, you know, there's a long history of communal quilting in African American history. Um, but it looks like in both cases, um, Harriet Powers and um, Rosie Lee Tompkins quilted alone. Um, Harriet Powers quilts, um, there's, even though there's some portions that are hand stitched, there are significant portions that are done by machine. And similarly for, um, for um, Rosie Lee Tompkins, she was um, doing her work on her own. Um, now in, um, in many cases, she was um, just really concerned about the design and not really interested in doing the filling and the backing. So other people would do um, the filling and the backing, um, but Powers, I mean, um, Rosie Lee Tompkins was really focusing on the design and the creative process and that part of the creative process. So these were not um, quilts that were done in um, small groups of women as was the case in some others. Um, in the case of um, Harriet Powers, she showcased her quilts um, at different fairs even after she sold the Bible quilt to Jenny Smith, that quilt was exhibited repeatedly um, in different, um, you know, large um, venues so that people could see it. Um, in Rosie Lee Tompkins case, she sometimes addressed a quilt to a specific individual and, you know, gave it to that individual, but it, it seems that most of her quilts that remained in her own possession um, with the exception of those that she gave to family members or gave to um, Eli, Eli Leon, who was a, a quilt collector. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Yes, an enticing question. How, um, how, you, how do you know about the other three quilts Har Harriet Powers made? And are there any photos or oh, yes. of them? Were there any sermon elements in them as well? Yes, that's, thank you for asking that question. Um, Harriet Powers mentions the other three quilts in a letter. And that's, that's the only um, evidence we have of them. She mentions them in a letter. Um, she mentions making the quilt with 4,050 diamonds, um, the star quilt and um, the Lord's Supper quilt. Um, it's possible that the, the Lord's Supper quilt in particular, since it's um, referred to in language that's similar to the Adam and Eve quilt, um, 
that um, that it included multiple panels and made some kind of theological argument. Um, but we don't know, those quilts have not been found. So um, we only know about them through her reference to them. I, uh, I wanted to uh, chip uh, to come in here and ask about the gospel mothers that you mentioned. Mm. I, I, mm -hmm. found, I find that extremely intriguing mm -hmm. uh, part of the culture that I, I, I haven't heard of before. Mm -hmm. And um, just speculating perhaps a little bit, uh, maybe of Harriet's interaction with these gospel mothers. I think you, you imply that she may have been a gospel mother possibly. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you tell us a little yeah, bit so, about the tradition? Yeah. Yes. Um, so Clarence Hardy writes about the gospel mothers um, in his research. And um, it's another way of pointing to the kind of um, informal authority that African-American women have in congregations, including Black, con um, ba Black Baptist congregations. And so to call someone a gospel mother is to acknowledge that they have a proclamatory role in the faith community, even if they were not, say, the pastor or an elder in that community. Um, and it, there's some fluidity in the kinds of roles um, people played. As I mentioned, you know, they might interpret people's dreams, they might offer advice, they might um, pray with people in addition to offering exhortations. Um, informally. Um, they also, um, in sharing prayers, might have given those aloud, you know, in the faith community. So it's important to recognize that even though there's a lot we don't know about um, Harriet Power's um, role in a specific congregation, that there was room for women to have proclamatory authority within Black Baptist congregations. Um, I have been to Athens and, um, you know, I went to Gospel Pilgrim. I um, have gone to the sites of um, the faith communities that um, um, Harriet Powers um, was thought to be a part of. And I just didn't come up with any records that, um, could help me um, get get more answers about her role in the congregation. So. Yeah, no, that that's that's always the case, isn't it? You know, the <laughs> questions we ask very often are alluded like that. Um, yeah. I wanted to say, Dr. McRae, that your talk has um, has inspired a uh, uh, an exhibition that uh, that uh, uh, some uh, quilters in Calgary have put together. Um, and uh, at the Grace Presbyterian Church. Um, and uh, what I, I've learned so much about quilting from you and, uh, and, and from uh, hearing what they say and, uh, and how they envision their own uh, act of quilting. And one of the things that you said about Rosie Lee Tompkins, about the texture, a lot of the quilters at Grace Presbyterian Church talk about the texture of the quilts as bringing a sense of, um, of comfort and mm -hmm. um, a sense of trying to indicate to the recipient who very often they don't know who will receive mm -hmm. it, but the, a sign of their, of their love and, and mm -hmm. God's love. And I was wondering if, that is in, if that's encountered in Rosie Lee Tompkins' quilting, if, she, if that's maybe one of the reasons why she likes the she liked the softness of you said the velvet and the velour yes she did yes yeah so well I, I think you know when she talks about hoping her quilts will spread a lot of love I think that tactility is a big part of that um Susan Dunlap um who um teaches pastoral um care pastoral theology at um Duke Divinity School has talked about the fact that in Protestantism, there is so often a lack of appreciation for tactility, that um, it's important as an expressive form, but also as a form of comfort for us. And I think quilts um, convey that deep sense of comfort 
collective people. And I th when I think about African-American history and the um, centuries of pain and loss of physical violence and abuse, um, the softness of a quilt has even more rhetorical power um, in um, asserting the humanity of the recipient, you know, of that quilt. So I, I, um, I could see why uh, the texture would be a really essential aspect of um, what the quilter is working with um, as a communicative um, medium. Yeah, that efficacious touch I really liked. Yeah. Um, that made me think of that. The comment here, um, it says, I am also a quilter and textile artist. The thought of quilt, uh, the thought of quilt as sermon is exciting and inspirational for me. Mm -hmm. Many of my art quilt colleagues make statement quilts in a political and or so social justice sense, mm -hmm. but I've not heard any of them referring to their work as preaching. I now have extensive notes and have much reading and learning to do. Thank you again. Oh, fantastic. Yes, I'm thinking of the AIDS quilts and mm -hmm. many quilts made for, um, you know, to make political statements. Um, so yes. Um, um, we have another question here. What is known about Harriet Powers' mother, uh, mother life? I guess her life as a mother, yeah. membership in a faith community and spirituality and quilting in general. Yeah. Yes. So there's so little known about Harriet Powers' mother. Um, and we have, you know, such limited fragments about, um, Harriet's um, life, but we know that um, she, I wish I had these notes handy. Um, we just know sort of geographically um, where she was in, in and around the Atlanta area, um, different family members, but, um, and I'm trying to rem remember if Harriet mentions in her letter whether or not she learned to quilt from her mother. I just do not remember off the top of my head and I don't wanna misstate the facts, but we know very little is the short answer about Harriet Power's mother. And there was a second part of that question, which I don't believe I remember. Um, uh, her, uh, her membership in the faith community, I guess her, her, her ac activity, I think you alluded to that earlier about not knowing fully how she may have uh, right if you and also about her quilting in general where she learned it but if you wanted to say more about those two things yeah yeah so we don't we we just know so very little about how she learned um you know it was it was not uncommon for someone to learn to quilt from a mother or a maternal figure you know it could have been an aunt grandmother um but um we don't know it's a short answer. What really struck me was the um, the different um, levels of uh, of representation on these quilts as a very effective form of preaching. You were pointing out, Dr. McCray, you had the traditional Hebrew Bible, as they would say, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then the moral of the story, or sometimes exemplar, maybe with the two. Is it uh, the bells? Um, yes. You know, yes. So all those. Um, uh, the confidence and ability that is represented in the quilting uh, seems to, uh, I mean, it, it, and let, you know, she could be a quilting genius on one level, or, you know, this tradition she's coming from may, may be just captured in her quilts, but have other quilting historians studied her? <clears throat> uh, they have, um, and I'm trying to remember one who suggests that um, the idea for the specific panels may have come from listening to sermons in church. And it could be that, you know, after hearing a sermon about Noah or about Jonah and the whale that Harriet went and, you know, quilted a panel um, to sort of memorialize these sermons and um, let them come together again in a larger format um, connected to all of these sermons. That could be, we don't know. Um, but 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 Harriet is intentional about providing the interpretation of the panel, so that we um, know that there is this theological um, basis for each one. 
Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I, I'm just going to read out one uh, last uh, thing. Uh, uh, one of the last uh, questions we had come in as a comment. It was a very interesting talk. Thanks so much. I would like to know more about symbolism in quilts if possible. Mm. What is the process of understanding these symbols? Is it transmitted through oral tradition or later in circles such as academia, these symbols are revealed, which the quilter may not have known about. So um, yeah, how the, how the images come about. Um, I guess the exegesis of these quilts. Yes, uh, the, it's a tremendous question and I want to know the answer to that perhaps more than you do. Um, we do know that some symbols such as um, the star symbols that um, appear in Harriet Powers quilts and um, they're also on a larger image of, of Harriet Powers, they're also quilted on her apron. Um, there may be a connection between those and certain um, African American clubs, um, you know, gatherings of laypersons to do work. Um, but um, again, these are these are fragments. Um, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich writes about that possibility um, and the need for more research on them. So, yes. Yes, and some other comments about, you know, the relation to the imagery that we see in medieval glass, stained glass, that there's the yes. richness there. Um, yes. But unfortunately, we are out of time. And um, I just want to, uh, I'm just going to send my email to uh, everyone who's here at the moment. Everyone should receive that. If you have any questions uh, that you'd like to for me to relay to Dr. McRae or anything about the lecture, please let me know. Uh, just a quick, if you have any questions about the exhibition I referred to, please write me. But uh, that aside, Dr. McRae, thank you so much uh, for this spectacular lecture, Bento lecture on Christian education and theology, and for introducing us to this wonderful world of alternative preaching and sermons that reveals so much imagination and creativity. Thank you once again for a, a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. It was great being with you. And I'd like to thank Zaritza. I'll hand it over to Zaritza. Thank you so much for, uh, co for uh, Zoom hosting. Thank you. Um, I really would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. McRae, that was a wonderful talk. Um, thank you, Caroline, as well. Um, and uh, also, um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for this um, presentation. And um, I would just like to share my screen here. Um, so some more information here. And uh, for more programs and other um, library services, please visit um, calgarylibrary.ca. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, again. Have a good uh, rest of the afternoon. <laughs>